All right. Thank you, everybody, for showing up today. Uh, we are starting off with 55. Really good. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time and sorry for what happened. So this is an open platform. You know, anybody can get on here and ask whatever they want. We don't gag anybody to speak. You know, Brian had his time to, he was asking questions, we we're answering, but I guess he got a bit uh, head because we were saying not everybody. I mean, but that is for a different conversation. So sorry for that, you know, back and forth. Uh, it's really one of those things, right? If you are here, nobody forced you to be here. It means you are here, you want to learn, you want to listen to something, right? So uh, please have the patience if you have a question and we've not been able to, you know, uh, get to your question. It doesn't mean we're not going to get to it, right? Okay. And if you have any other, you know, major concerns that you need one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, we are open. Our email and everything we posted on there, you can check us out. Email us, talk to us, you know, but we're not going to allow any one person to hold like the whole program hostage and just waste everybody's time, okay? So today uh, we are continuing our series of, you know, talking to people who are actually working in the industry for them to share their knowledge with us and also to walk us to, to walk us through their journey of moving from one industry and getting into uh, the cybersecurity industry, right? So like the process that they went through interviews and stuff and then what they are doing right now. So today we have one of our own, uh, Kenny, uh, it was uh, one, one of our cyber, uh, uh, one of our hands-on training uh, students and he's currently in our PCI DSS class. Uh, Kenny has been working for a while now, I think uh, almost two months, getting to three months. And he's coming back, he's gracious enough to come back to, uh, you know, enlighten us on what he's doing on the job now. And then also he walk us through like his whole journey and like the entire process that he went through to get to where he is now. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and, you know, uh, uh, I've introduced Kenny, so I'm going to give him the floor for him to also speak and uh, introduce himself and then we'll kick it from there. So. Go ahead, Kenny. Good evening, everyone. So, um, I'm going to start off with a little bit about um, where I started, my, my, where I started from my career. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my college background. And um, just on the personal level, I'm, I'm Haitian American. Um, my, my parents are, are immigrants. Um, and their mindset always been to do um, that, that, you know, all the kids have to do something in healthcare. You know, like I know a few people mentioned um, in the past weeks that CNA, nursing, like anything with anything healthcare, you, you know, that's, that's what we do. And, and, um, and I know social work has been something that um, also got introduced to my family. And so we have a lot of social workers, masters in, in social work and, and stuff like that. So, um, so I, I, I grew up um, in that type of setting. Um, and then I would say um, we we are we are um, the African diaspora, Caribbean. Just so you know, um, us Haitians are African. If even if um, a lot of people in the world don't don't know that, but even though we're colonized by the French, we're, we're African. Um, and then um, during my college during my college days, when I first started, I was undecided, didn't know what to do. I literally went undecided for two years. So I was literally taking classes um, that, I was just taking general prerequisite classes that could go to like different disciplines. So oh, I was, yeah. sorry. I think, um, go ahead. So uh, let me mute everybody that way. Okay. And then you can unmute yourself and then write. Or mute yourself, Kenny. Thank you. Okay, back to what I was saying. So I, I, I took all these um, prerequisite classes. Because you have to say. And then, and then after I end up choosing um, pre-pharmacy after being undecided for so many different disciplines. So I tried like history, I tried, like I, I just didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I had to get a degree for my, for my family. And I, and I was trying to stay away from healthcare, um, but so happens to be it, I, that I end up doing uh, 
um, pre-pharmacy because my dad had a friend in Georgia that did pharmacy. So he's like, why don't you try this? So I tried, I tried pre-pharmacy and then I got, I got an associate's in it. Um, I did okay, didn't have the highest grade that I wanted in it, but I applied at one school and um, I, I only applied at one and, and I got rejected. They put me on a waiting list and I got rejected. It was University of Rhode Island. I still have a vendetta with them to this day, but, but it's okay. It wasn't, it wasn't meant for me at this time. So um, moving on to that, I, I went from that associates and I went to get my bachelor's and then I got interested in business. Um, I had a friend of mine that was doing a lot of stuff in cell phones and telecommunication. So I was thinking, you know what, if I, if I learn business theory, I will, you know, I'll, I can do something with that, with business management or um, administration, finance in, in that area. So I went on to do that. Um, and then I figured after getting that bachelor's, I could have learned this, all this from home online or something without having to go through um, commuting and whatever, and, and being on campus for a little bit um, with people that I didn't want to be with, but at the time I had to do what I had to do. So just to please my parents, I, I did what I had to do. And then um, during that time, um, while I was in college, I tried different types of entrepreneurial um, type of um, businesses. I tried a moving company. I tried, I tried anything you could think of, e-commerce. Um, but everything that I was doing, I didn't have like a foundation or a framework to it. It was just trying things, um, taking money uh, off my credit and just and throwing in it, it um, throwing it into a project um, with developers overseas and I don't even know what they're doing. I, I, at the time, I didn't know nothing about IT. I didn't know how the process works or anything. I'm just, luckily, um, I got scammed on, on a big project that I want to do. I want to be a, I want to be a big blogger. And, um, and then um, one of the, it was, a, it was a group in India. Um, uh, actually, I remember their name to this day. It was, it was a company called Redshift.in. And they promised me, oh, if you give us this 5,000, we're gonna get your blog to be the biggest in the world, blah, blah, blah. And it, and it never happened. Um, I, months delayed, it never, it never went through. So I was like, man, for me to do ever do a online project, I gotta understand like IT stuff. And I, so I just dropped that. Then, um, then I said, you know what, let me get some experience in healthcare and, and do what my, my parents said. So then I, be, then I took some PCA courses Then I became a PCA. I worked with paraplegics for a while. Um, and the disabled at a few nonprofits. Um, the job made me humble. I liked it um, for what it was. And then I, I moved on from that um, and then went back to a business role as an assistant manager at Honey Farms. It's like one of those little convenience stores. So I did that for a few years to get some experience. Um, and and then my, my next move from that bachelor's was, you know, I, I was like, I can't get a real professional job that I want to get like something in finance and, and something dealing with stocks. Um, so then after that, I went to work in health insurance. So um, Max Health was pushing a, a, a program, it's called a, a PCA program where you're actually setting up for the people that actually need PC. You're setting up for patients. So I did that for a while. Um, but I'd say about, about two, two to three years. Um, and at, well, just before that, I, I was, um, I did need to be, I, forgot, I, I missed that part. After I left the um, job at Honey Farms, I went to go to B2B, so as business to business sales. Um, selling um, cell phone parts and equipment and also plans. Um, I did it for T-Mobile for a while. And then after I, I started um, exporting um, uh, Blackberries, because Blackberries were very big at the time. So me and a few buddies, we started um, buying and selling online. 
um, used in new blackberries and we we have a contact in New York and we ship them to Africa, the Caribbean and Asia, the Caribbean and Asia. Um, can, you, can I uh, catch you off here real quick? Uh, it seems like your uh, audio is a bit uh, coming in and out. Oh, I was thinking maybe it was just me, but I think uh, a few couple of other people are, are putting it in the chat. So if you can uh, readjust your audio for us, please. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you still have that little uh, thing in there. If you can like mute, mute and unmute yourself, maybe probably that can help. Yeah, I'm getting a, I'm getting a lag. Um, let me see if I can use my phone. Okay. You know, give me one minute. And while Spenning is trying to get with his phone, I think there are some questions in here. I'm going to look at real quick. Okay, so Prisla, uh, Yeah, some people had like comments about Brian in there. Forget him. But okay, but first I was asking, what are some of the examples of uh, specialty positions available out there? Okay, so uh, first I'm not sure if you're talking about job titles or uh, like what exactly do you mean by specialty? Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes, but I think you have to turn one of your audios yeah. off. Yeah, it doesn't the one for your laptop. Yeah. Or... I think like the audio for the phone is good. So you probably have to mute yourself on the laptop. I know. Hold, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. No, he has to turn off completely the laptop. Turn off completely the laptop. Okay, and then just go with the, with the phone. Okay, uh, I think uh, we can do that. Okay. Okay, so you should be able to hear me clear now. Yes, I think that is way better. Okay, so back and to where- And I'll get back to your question. Okay, so go ahead, please, Ken. Okay, back to where I, where I was mentioning. So I, I did the um, the business to business sales, I exported the phones. And then after that, um, then BlackBerry lost their market share. We, we had um, dissolved that business. Everybody moved on. So now I'm stuck. So now I need to make my next move. So- my next move was to go into health insurance. Um, so I didn't want to be a PCA again. Um, I went, I, I applied, I went to a mass health website and then they gave companies that nonprofits that are working to help um, patients um, become, um, to help patients become their own um, owners of their own PCA program. So these patients would need training to be able to hire their own PCA, to be able to pay that PCA, and then we would set them up with um, with a with a business company that would help them with payrolls. So I was I was called the skills trainer at the time. So I did that for about um, about three years, and then um, and it, it was going well and everything. But um, the company started to make um, new directions. So I felt like you know I I have to. I'm a smart guy. I have to make I have to make my next move because I I, I want to be this healthcare. Um, I want to be a healthcare mogul. I want to be a top. That's that's my mind to be a, a healthcare CEO one day. So I applied at a, a bigger nonprofit that was literally across the street from the job I was working at. Um, and and then they had a they had an opening that I seen online, um, and that was in in 2017. And I I quickly jumped on it then I got a call I got a call like two two days um, later so now I'm at a bigger health insurance not the biggest in my state in Massachusetts but it, it was big enough to to be to have access to a lot of um, a lot of patients and and data and so forth so I 
I did that for a few years. Um, actually, that was my most recent job. So I did that more than a few years. And I, that's when I met, um, met Sheila um, at my job because she, she was working in the same department. We were on the same team. Um, and, you know, I, I, we, we, were, we were a close-knit team. Everything is good. Like, just like any other job could be for a lot of you on here. Things are going well. And then management shifts things around. Um, and, and you just get, you know, shocked out of place. Certain things start happening. You, 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 you start having um, issues with the new management. I'm sorry, did, did Dr. Duty say something? No, I think uh, probably somebody unmuted themselves. Like, go ahead. Okay, so, so yeah, so, um, so during that time, I looked for opportunity while we had all these changes. Um, we were getting moved around different floors, different assignments. And um, I even asked um, one of our vice presidents that I was close to, to help me get a, to help me do like a internship. Um, because she, she was like a mentor that would, that would um, tell me, you know, you need a, you need a, you need a pivot soon. You need to get into something else pretty soon because this is not going to last forever. And um, when she told me that she, she gave me, um, she gave me these schools to do a master's degree in. And I'm like, man, I can't, I can't go back to do a master's because I'm going to be spent like one of the schools she mentioned um, was Babson College. It's in it's in Wellesley, Mass. It's a business school, but it was I but I got in for a program, but they wanted seventy thousand dollars a year. So I said, I I, I can't do seventy thousand dollars a year. I'm not going to even have loans to cover this. And then I had some I had some student loan debt from my undergrad. So I'm like, this is this is not the thing for me. I took one class. And that one class was five thousand dollars. Like probably, it was I, I'm exaggerating. Probably around, I don't know. But I know it was like eight hundred dollars of credit or something like that. So I was like, you know, I, I I can't do this. So I took that one class, got my B, and I left. I bounced. So um, then I I I seen these courses online. Um, um, edX. I don't know if you're at edX.com. So. They, they do partnerships with other schools. And I seen a project management um, master certificate. So I was like, you know what? Let me see what this project management's about. It has a little bit about business and then it kind of pivots um, in other areas. Maybe I could be a project. I, I didn't care what area it was gonna be in, but I just wanted to learn a little bit about international project management. So I did, I did um, that certificate um, for like a whole year. I did it in 2018. Um, I got it done. And then like, like I was saying to you guys before, while the management was going crazy, making all types of moves, I get a bad, I get a bad manager during this time where, because our good manager that we had, she, she, they basically did whatever they can to push her out. And you know, people work, sometimes people work for managers not jobs, um, sometimes it's the other way around. But in my case, I was really working for the manager. And um, once, that, once, once um, she basically left and went to another insurance company, so we were left with the, the manager that didn't know what she was doing. And so the, the, the last year and a half, I was going through some soul searching and Sheila was vital in that soul searching. Um, and a couple of times I talked to her, and, um, and Kwame would be on the line, you know, rooting like, we have this guy that does, um, that does our, is a guy that we had a, that um, Sheila and Kwame did a class with first. They told me about this guy. And then I, I, I took that class. So I learned the whole RMF process. Um, and then he gave me a resume, which I still kept um, until last year. And, um, I know Sheila or, or Kwame might have tried um, to get jobs during that time, but I didn't hear too much. So I kind of lost hope not hearing much, you know, for, I know Sheila did a couple of interviews, but then after I was like, man, she, she might've not got something now. So like, what's going to happen? So then I, I did an interview. I forgot it was some contractor out in New Jersey. 
And he started asking me all types of questions that had nothing to do with RMF. So I'm like, why is this guy going into, um, if your browser is this way, what, what is going on? What type of attack is going on um, if, if, if you start seeing um, that your, your URL is not being routed the right way? Just random questions. I can't even remember them to this day. That's how confused I was that day. And, and I just remembered just pausing there and stalling, just stuck on one of his questions. I was like, this ain't, this ain't it. This is not it. <laughs> like, this, this is not for me. Like, I want to do this IT stuff because I, I, I was telling people at work, I'm going to get into IT. You know, I, I've been doing research about because I'm a person that reads. Um, and it wasn't working out. So I'd say months went by and um, and while we're in the middle of the, tra the transition with this manager, Sheila tells me in the summertime, I find this, I found this new guy. I was like, in my head, I'm like, yeah, right. You know, she's like, yes, I, I found, I found someone that's going to help us, but let me do the class first. And, and, um, and then we'll, and then we'll see what happens from then. And then I remember um, her and I guess Kwame were, were taking a class and they said, this guy, Dr. Du, blah, 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 yada, yada, few phone calls and, 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 um, and few conversations at work. And then um, she was like, when I get back from Ghana, I'm, I'm, I'm out, I'm, I'm, I'm making moves. So I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm still like, all right, I'm gonna see, you know, like I, I'm, cause I'm just following, I'm just following to pivot because I wanna see if it's gonna work. So then it comes like October of last year, 2021, then next thing you know, out of nowhere, Sheila's like, guess what? I just did an interview. And I think, you know, I think, I think things might work out. And then she's like, I'm getting help on this, on this interview and, and yada, yada, yada. And she said, um, Dr. Du's, Dr. Du helped me. I, I, I did a few, I did, um, I did the class and he's helping me with the interview. And I was like, okay. I was like, we'll see. You know, maybe she'll get, I'm thinking in my head, maybe she'll get a call back in two, two weeks or three weeks. And you, who knows what's going on? We're in a pandemic. We might not hear nothing back. Then next thing you know, the next day, she's like, guess what? I got the job. <laughs> so when she said she got the job, literally my heart was beating fast, like, Man, like I, I remember, I remember after um after work that day, I was sitting in my car. I'm like, this Doctor Do guy must be like, like he must be out of this world. Like some some like like who where does guy come from? So so I'm like, she's like, you need to get in contact. Um, you need to get in contact with him. You need to talk to him. I mean, she gave me the she gave me Doctor Do's contact way before that, but I was still kind of like hesitant i'm still waiting i need to see results because you know like i have faith but not blind faith i'm like half and half i gotta see like something happening so when she said i got the job i remember calling i remember i called dr do and then um he didn't answer i text him on whatsapp um and then i think he seen my text or whatever and then he said something about like i'll get back to you later I'm like, man, this guy needs to get back to me now. Like, Sheila just got this job. And then um, I'd say like, a, I'd say like um, um, that night, um, Dr. Du calls me. And then I tell him a little bit about what I want to do. Um, and this is probably like in the beginning of November, I think. And, and I'm like, Dr. Du, I, I took this class already. Um, I know the entry level stuff. I've been studying. Because during, during that year and a half, I've been doing my own study, even after that RMF, after I did that interview also, that, that, that I bombed, I was still doing my, my own studies on cybersecurity. And I told him, I think my weakness right now is hands-on. You know, like theory, I feel like I could pick up. And I was also desperate at the time to get out this job because 
one of the other components to me trying to leave this job is because Sheila was leaving the job and and what was going on was a lot of bad stuff towards the end of end of last year where there was a lot of discrimination going on um especially towards me um and a few of my uh, and a few of my um my coworkers so i and and Sheila was always like that um that person that would be on the team to always had had great leadership um to you know to to motivate us to tell us like if if things go south you need a you need to do so she she's like she would say Kenny you're a man you need to you need to do what you have to do and um and a, and a few of my other coworkers she told the same the same thing um so that was a wake up call in that that final conversation with her and then um I started the I, I paid for the hands on class, forgot how much it was, but I I got my credit card, and um, signed up, and then during that time I signed up for the class. Um, I was I was going through it slow and going through different sections, but I started interviewing because I'm like, okay, Sheila's gone, but I can do this within two three months. I gotta go. The, the demands of this company, they're not paying me enough to deal with this demand. They gave me a raise. Um, they gave me like a good seven, eight thousand dollar raise, but I'm like, even with that raise, I'm still out. That was my mindset. And every night of research in cybersecurity. Um, and then I remember I started my whole interview process. The only reason why I didn't ask Dr. Du for help on the on the interview process and so forth, because my mindset was that I need to get out this place. So I didn't have, there was not enough time for me to say, Dr. Do, go over my resume, um, help, help me with the questions. I just went on Indeed. I put out, I put out the resume that I had from the RMF guy. And it, it wasn't even a polished resume. I don't, I don't even know what he put on it. Um, and, and mind you, I haven't even done Security Plus. I was just reading the Security Plus book and I was reading the malware analysis book that I bought on Amazon. So I'm just going, but I have no foundation. I'm just going through the motions. So then I put out 50 applications in the in in like the last the um the first two weeks of November. 50 applications. Um I learned online about something called ATS resume. So ATS is a is a type of thing that when you apply on companies' websites, they basically knock your resume out through a computer system when it doesn't match the description. So I, I had hindsight about that already. Um, so I just changed the I just changed the job description on my resume, you know. To show that I that I, that you know that I know the cybersecurity stuff, but at the same time it was mostly RMF stuff, so it wasn't even like foundational fundamentals of cybersecurity. And I and I know that that could have been better if I you know if I if if I had gone um, through Doctor Do for the resume and um, maybe the entry level course with him on on certain things when it came to. Um, the foundational stuff, but I'll get into that later. So I, I pretty much um, did 50 applications. Indeed, I went on companies' websites. I went on LinkedIn. There was a, um, I looked for the black professionals that were on, that were on LinkedIn, try to reach out to them. And I'm like, hey, I, I've been learning cybersecurity. Is there anything that you could help me out, help a brother out, you know? Um, Anything that I could do to get my name. Then there was this lady from Hologic, and it's funny that Isaac mentioned Hologic um, <laughs> um, when he when he was doing his talk. So there was an entry level for uh, a compliance analyst position, and it was a it was a um, a black lady. She was in she was like a privacy officer. So she said, "I'll set you up with an interview," and sent me sent my information to the recruiter then i'm on the phone with the recruiter then the recruiter tells me 
yeah, you know, um, we think that you have, you might have, you might have what it takes. Ask me a few questions about cybersecurity, um, where I took courses. I, I, I let them know the whole spiel, um, and a little bit about my background. And he was at the end of the call. He was like, "This position only offers sixty five thousand. Are you gonna take it? Would you Would you mind taking it? And this job is in Marlboro, Mass. It's it's only um fifteen twenty minutes from your house. I'm like." I'm at, the, I'm at the point of desperation to get out this, this job that I'm in. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Send me on to the second interview. So I, so I, now I go back to the lady that I first reached out. The recruiter said, gave me the clearance to talk to her. And then when I talked to her, it seemed like everything is going good um, with the interview. Um, and then I'm asking her questions. She's asking questions. So we're flowing. We're talking about everything from from RMF to technical stuff on, on networking, just the whole spiel. But then after, at the end of it, I felt like bad luck was coming. Not, not that I was just superstitious because she just kept coughing the last 15 minutes. And I'm like, man, this, maybe this lady has COVID or something. Like she, I, I think, or maybe she's saying, or maybe she's indirectly letting me know, like, um, you're not the one. So, she basically um, told me someone will get back to you, and I didn't hear I didn't hear back from anyone for at least two weeks. And then I I, I called Sheila and I'm like, yeah, this job, you know, I have I have the hookup. I'm waiting on this lady. And then Sheila was like, you can't just wait on, you just can't wait on somebody that 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 gives you um, some hope. You need to just keep keep applying. So then. I probably did like 20 resumes, so I did 30 more. Again, that, that third week in November. And then that's when I started, I, I started getting hits because I was, I was very persistent. Um, so to make a long story short, I got 10, um, had about 10 interviews within a two to three week span. So I'm taking time off at that current job at the time. To, to, to do interviews. And even, even while I'm having stress to keep up with the work, I'm taking breaks from the work to do, the, to do all the phone interviews. So from those 10 interviews, I got, um, there was four. So I got 10 first, um, 10 phone interviews. And then four of them were second interviews with, um, with ISSOs and um, either privacy officers or ISSMs that are on the on the technical side, the cybersecurity. Um, I know one of them was University of Michigan, a uh, cybersecurity engineering job that was, it was like for like about $140,000 on the salary. But I felt, I looked into the job description and I looked at all the requirements. And then I remember calling Sheila and um, she was looking at the description and she's like, you would have to look at this. You'd have to look at that. And I had to really tell myself, I'm like, even though this is one of the four and a high paying salary, I can't do it. I have to be honest with myself. So then I, I basically, um, dropped, I, I, I just basically dropped out. Um, and I told, I contacted their HR and I said, I have to, you know, I have to get out of this situation and I can't. Um, I can't apply with you guys anymore, so withdraw me. So we draw me, so I had three left. So I had a UMass hospital, and then um, a company in New York, and then the current job I'm at right now, Spatial Front, a government contractor. So these three, um, I, did, I did all those interviews, so I'm waiting back for a second call. I, I, got, um, I got second calls um, from um, the medical hospital. Then they wanted me to speak with the chief information officer with the medical hospital. So I'm like, man, I already did a second interview with them. Now they want me to go to a chief information officer for what? So I, I, I do that um, interview with him. He asked me questions. Um, basically, same thing about like um, standards. Um, and frameworks that I would use at my company, talk to me about privacy awareness and, and so forth. So I answered all those questions. And he said, this process takes a while, so just hang on. 
So I'm like, man, this is gonna be a while and there's other candidates. And they told me there was so many candidates. So now the government contractor, I, um, I did the interview with her um, and she instantly liked me um, and we flowed. And she was like, she was like, I, I, looked, at, I looked at your resume that she was like, um, it doesn't matter. She was like, are you, are you, um, are you good with um, hands-on tools? With, um, she asked me about everything, about Splunk, Nessus, and the tools that I'm using right now, Web Inspect and App Detective. And, um, and, if she, and she was like, you might have not used a code scanner in the past, but we could, you know, she let me know that, um, that would that be something that you can pick up? And I, I let her know, I was like, yes, I could, I could pick this up and yada, yada, yada. So, um, so I, I did that interview and I felt very confident about the government contractor because she was saying how they were gonna support the Department of Transportation, um, federal, and, and, I'm, and I, I, I felt confident about it. I called Dr. Du, I let him know that this is in the pipeline and I, I think I, I, I can get this. Um, and then Dr. Du said, if you do need a reference, um, that, that he's there for me to, to do my reference. So um, this is something that I don't think everyone does, but I wrote a letter back to, um, back to the project manager that was, that was hiring me. And she stated, um, she stated that it, it will take a month or two, but just hang on and then she's gonna make her final decision. And then I believe on the second week of December, she got back to me. And then um, they, they, um, the HR um, sent me an offer letter. And at first the offer letter said, um, I was getting 3,300 for bi-weekly every two weeks. Um, so I'm like 3,300. And um, I talked to friends um, and, and they were like, you know, you should, you should take what you can because it's, it's, it's like around 40% higher than what you were making. And, and I also reached out to, to um, Sheila and Kwame at the time. And, you know, she was like, you can negotiate for more, but, you know, just, just get on it right away because you got an offer. So then I, I bid, I asked them, um, you know, for at least, I was like, I need at least 30, give me 36. So um, 36 bi-weekly. So they settled that me settled with 35, um, 3,500 every two weeks. So I was like, I, I, I'm cool with that. So, um, so then I had to go through a whole process. Um, with a government contractor, you have to go through um, a public trust. You gotta go through, uh, you have to have a PI, you get a PIV card. Um, once you start, it's a personal um, identification verification card. Um, so you could have access to, you know, private servers. And, um, and I did that, so, so I'm here today. And, and I'm doing the PCI class with Dr. Du. And, and I have plans on using cybersecurity so I could do business back to my business um, roots again in the future. All right, Kenny, uh, thank you. you uh, pretty much saved me a lot of questions, but now we're going to go into what you do on a daily basis. So can you walk us through your day? You know, uh, you wake up in the morning. I, I like, do you work uh, remotely or do you go there in person? And if you can walk us through your day. All right. So right now I, I work remotely. Um, I pretty much, when I first started, there was no real schedule. It was, we have morning, um, we have morning meetings, so we have a, a team, like it's, it's like a, a, a team, it's called the SFI team meeting. So I'm on the application operations team. So we basically support um, all the applications for the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Um, so we have morning meetings at nine, um, Monday through Friday, and then throughout the day, I'll have like a, it's, it's a, I'm on a, I'm on a very small team right now because our project, um, cause since we're a contractor, we're supporting other cybersecurity professionals within, um, within our component. 
So I was the second person to come on. We had a, a, um, a cybersecurity engineer that was hired who's my supervisor. He was a former ISSO and ISSM with 20 years of Navy experience. And, um, and the beauty about it is he, he was a, a, he's an African-American professional and, and uh, me and him get along well. And he's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you everything that I know. He's a CISSP. And um, so I have meetings with him um, between nine and 12. Um, and then I would say um, there's department-wide meetings, a, a few meetings throughout the day. And then in the afternoon, I, that's when I designate myself to do scanning. So I, I'm the one that helps out with continuous monitoring um, of the applications that we support. And I, I pretty much use a, a scanner for our web application and targeted URLs that we want to um, check vulnerabilities on. And then also um, we have a database um, scanner that we use called App Detective. And um, so we, um, we use a lot of, of Oracle DB. So a lot of um, scanning with, with that. And then, um, and if there's, depending on if there's critical or highs, then I would, because the medium and the lows, we don't usually focus on, on that right away on, on a daily basis. We have time, we have timetables um, for those, like, like you would learn in, in um, Dr. Dew's classes, which he goes over a lot. Um, and pretty much that's my day. It's very flexible. Um, I would say, um, it's really, I would say hard work. I'd probably say like four hours, even though I'm there on, on business hours throughout the day, but there's no one there to tell me do this to do that. I mean, my supervisor just lets me know what we need help on and, and so forth. Okay. And, uh, uh, thank you about that, Kenny. Yeah. Uh, and like, what are some of the tools that you use on a daily basis? But before you answer that, can you give us an idea about like your cybersecurity infrastructure for your organization or the ones that you, you like your organization uh, supports? So in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. like how many servers, like how many uh, uh, like workstations and whatnot, that way we get like a good concept. And also if you can elaborate more on like what you guys do in terms of, like you said, you are supporting uh, mm -hmm. the Department of Transportation. So what does that all entail? You know, and then I'll have like a follow-up then I'll give the floor to everybody to ask their question. Okay, so um, so right now we we have about that we have a lot of service. To tell you, I I don't have the exact number because right now we're actually going through um, a lot of upgrading um, because we had a lot of old stuff. Um, but so in the Department of Transportation, we have different components under it. So I'm with. FMCSA. So we basically are dealing with applications with um, with truck drivers, um, clearing house, and so forth. So we're scanning these apps um, for vulnerabilities, and we have a software development lifecycle. We have upgrades that devs are working on every two weeks, um, and. That, and that software development lifecycle, we have releases on them. So we have pre-alpha, alpha, beta. Um, so that's like de development, um, integration into staging and then into production. So on a daily basis, depending on what release is sent out by the release manager to me and my supervisor, we have, um, we have all these servers that we have to basically, um, I lost my train of thought, but we have all these servers that basically are getting updated based on the release. If they're, after the devs do a, a code change or an upgrade or, um, or we have a new application, once it goes into integration, then that's when I would do a, a scan on, that target, on those targeted URLs. And then I would scan with the app detective for the database that is behind um, behind that front end, um, and then the same thing that would go like once the once the life cycle would go on into the next environment into staging, then there would be 
Um, a, there would be scans done for that. And then we do monthly scans um, to, to keep the continuous monitoring. And also too, we have meetings on, on RMF stuff. So that's where the RMF, that I, RMF um, knowledge that I learned in the past came into play. So my supervisor, who's the cybersecurity engineer, he has a lot of experience in that. So he takes on that role where we have to, um, we have to respond to a lot of um, data calls that we receive from an office called the OIG office. So they're also, make, they're also making sure that all the components within Department of Transportation, so you have like FAA, FMCSA. So you have, um, so this, it basically those components are basically departments. So all those departments, the OIG is like the government that's basically checking on is, is the security posture of, of, our, of our mode, is, is everything right? Is everything going well? Are we keeping up with all the documents um, and so forth? Okay, and uh, my last question, and then I'll uh, give the floor. Uh, so, I mean, you, now you are talking about, you know, all these and uh, like the different levels in the transportation and scans and stuff that you do. Your first day on the job, like in your first meeting, how was it? And how did it go? My first day on the job was great. I, I did something like this. I, I went on um, Zoom. We, I went on Teams because we use Microsoft Teams. Um, so to get into the, because I didn't get in the nitty gritty of the software's view. So we use Microsoft Teams to communicate um, on a daily basis. Um, and that's that's pretty easy to use. Um, we use um, we use a software called Jira. Um, it's an agile software to help the team um, put tickets in and put tickets out and communicate with each other. And from Jira, it goes into another software called Confluence. So Confluence makes all these tickets and issues going on easy on a easy on a daily basis. Um, so my first day on the job, I just we went through all the all the tools that I would be using so I could just communicate with my team, and then coming on a video chat um, on, on Teams and just introducing myself. But on a daily basis, we don't actually show ourselves. Um, most people are in their pajamas. Um, some people are in bed um, while they're working and communicating with everyone. Okay, thank you, Kenny. Uh, I'm gonna open the floor to, I think first question will be uh, OBDK. Go ahead, please. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, I have a question for Kenny. Uh, uh, I think you said y'all deal with IDS, intrusion and detections, and uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you if y'all use Wireshark or like what uh, what the products do y'all use in IDS? Uh, could you hold on one second? My, I'm sorry, my lighting is going out. So. All right, I'm sorry, can you repeat your question again? Okay, so I, I was gonna, I was gonna, uh, I said like, uh, I think you said you deal on IDS, right? Intrus intrusion and detection. Uh, I was gonna ask like, what kind of products do y'all use for that? Is it like, do y'all use like Wireshark? Or yeah. like, uh, what's it called? Uh, or like, uh, 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 what's it called? Root kits? Like what kind of uh, product do y'all use for the government? And do y'all like require uh, security clearance to work? Um, okay, so um, what I what I do on a daily basis, since I'm since I'm on, I'm in applications and operations, I'm not actually using tools like Wireshark, Wireshark, um, like the Nessus scans. That's an actual different um, department that actually handles because we have something called enterprise shared services. So the enterprise shared services that handles like our um, basically our, our environments and our cloud environments and so forth, they handle um, the security with like the wire sharks and they have a they have a a, a, a SOC a security operations center that's twenty four seven that's doing monitoring even while um, 
the applications operations analysts like me are are off duty, they're still running throughout the throughout the night. So I can't um, specifically say what tools they use, but I know that they use a majority of of, of those tools. Um, the Wire Sharks, the Nessus, um, Splunk. Splunk is big with that uh, with the operations and infrastructure team. So um, we basically share a lot of common controls and a lot of our standards we share with them. So it's it's a it's a shared um, services with the mode. And then um, to get to your question about the security clearance, um, it's just for me it was a low level um, public trust. Um, luckily for me, they didn't do a they didn't check on my references. I guess they just did the regular employment a reference. They didn't. They never called any of the people that I had for my references. Okay, Kenny, uh, there's a uh, there's a question in the chat from Prisla. She's asking okay. how long was onboarding and uh, training for you before you started on your first day? Um, I would have to say I learned on the job because the the they gave me my onboarding material like one week in advance. So I was just sent documents and I had to read through um, over 40 to 60 pages to understand what my contractor does um, and the rules that I have to abide with the contractor and then um, rules that I have to abide on the government side with the federal motor carry. So I had to um, go through these documents and the project manager that hired me at the time um, just said that these next couple of weeks, you're gonna have to, um, you're gonna have to drink from the fire hose and you're a smart guy, you'll pick it up on the run. Okay, and uh, before I let Eric in, there is, uh, I'll look at like some of these questions. So uh, Fred is also asking, how often do you write a report or narratives uh, on case files? So far, we, right now we're, so right now we're in transition of upgrading a lot of our servers. So we have, we have servers right now that are on Windows 2008. And, and right now we can't even, I, I don't want to go too, too much details over, over this because it is um, my, yeah, my work's information. Mm -hmm. um, but right now we're, we're fixing that security posture where we'll be able to do those case writings. Um, incident response where my supervisor right now, we're in the process of updating a lot of our documents um, from a previous administration that was there before. That's all I can say at this point, at this time. Okay, and uh, Mona also is asking, did any of your uh, job interviews ask about proof of COVID vaccination? Um, Yes, all pretty much all the jobs ask for proof of COVID vaccination, um, and they let you know um, you can either you can either um, put in a exemption form, or you could give the proof of vaccination. I mean, it's it's pretty much straightforward. Um, so pretty much, I I think all the interviews last year, um, and going into January because. I, I try to do a couple of applications and I found out most of those jobs, you have to, you have, to have a COVID vaccine. Yeah. Okay, so now I'll let uh, Eric go. Eric, uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself yeah. and ask your question. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Adu. Uh, thank you, Kenya, for your presentation. Uh, that was good to share your experience. So my question is, um, you were talking about uh, scanning and uh, if I understood, I understood it, you are dealing with a government. So, mm -hmm. and the government deal with for many vendors. When you do scanning and mm -hmm. you find any uh, vulnerability, where do you send that report? And uh, mm -hmm. how do you, um, like, uh, how do you follow up? Or, I'm trying to understand that you found it. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, so from the, from the scanning, so, what happens is each scan that I do, so we have a, a, a summary. So when you, so you're basically, for an example, I, I'll, I'll talk about like when we're doing like a web app, um, I'll put in a targeted URL in our web app scanner. It's called web inspect. And I'll put in a, I'll put in what you call a login macro. So I don't have to keep, cause 
sometimes I scan two or three times um, so I can get a, a summary version of the scan and I want a detailed version of that scan. Um, and sometimes you can, miss, you can miss a few things even on the scan. So you have to, you have to just know how to use the, you have to use, know how to use the tool, which I was taught. I was, I was taught by one of the um, ISSOs on the government side. And you set up a login macro so you can go back anytime you need to log in onto the, onto the application. You need to tell the web, the, the web scanner um, to go back to that login. So you, it has your username and password and so forth. And then, um, and it's, it's, it's already preset for each environment. So if I'm going into beta, into integration, after the devs do, do whatever they do with the coding, um, then they send me, the, the devs will let the release manager know that. And then the release manager lets me know that they're ready to scan. So when I put in that targeted URL, it's for that specific environment after the devs um, finished it. And then after the devs, um, and then after when I'm done doing my scans, based on the vulnerabilities that I see, um, I let my release manager know I've seen a critical high or um, I've I seen a critical or a high. And then how many of these mediums, um, we check and see if it's important. Then my release manager will um, send, it, send it to another team. So we have a cyber, we have a cyber team that's above us. So, so basically I'm not per se like, um, I analyze the scans, but I don't actually make the final decision on, um, on if the devs have to do more work on that app or not. Okay, uh, and I have a little follow up on that. So uh, Kenny, when you talk about analyzing the scan, like what does that lead you mean? Um, so analyzing the scan, so you'll have a summary um, that will come out in PDF. And um, from, that, from that summary, they'll, the vulnerabilities, they'll, they'll be certain codes or certain, certain things that the devs could have been working on um, that are giving errors. You have a lot of, sometimes you get poor errors. Um, you get false positives, false negatives. Um, and then I'm basically bringing it back to my team based on what I, what I conclude. Um, and sometimes I, I look it up um, on myself based on what vulnerability I see based on, the, on that PDF summary. And then I'll take it um, to my supervisor or I'll take it to the team because everyone on the team has security knowledge pretty much. So it's a, it's a project agile um, software development team. So they, they specialize um, in that. So everyone has a little bit of um, security awareness, privacy awareness and, and and so forth. So it's a little bit easy on my job that I'm actually taking a scan and actually working with people that even if they're developers or engineers, they can instantly, you know, say, okay, this is something wrong with the code. Um, and then whatever, whatever on a security standpoint, a security posture that I see, um, then I can make a decision to, to take it back to, to my ISSO. Okay. Uh, Shilla, go ahead, and then Laura, and then we will give the floor to Isaac. Thank you. Uh, so, Kenny, uh, yep. my job, we use um, like status report to, we call it status report. What okay. I'm talking about is, I'm hoping that you can, um, people could understand how to report their work. So it work like every morning after you have done your eight hours, tell your supervisor, this is what I did, this is what I did. We report weekly. And that is what we call the status report. I'm wondering, do you guys do the same? Do you report your work like weekly? Do you report in terms of like pro your productivity, how you went by your day? Uh, do you so, have to report it daily? Do you have to report it weekly? How do you guys do it. So our so our productivity is through the meetings every morning. So we basically have to um, just give a summary of how the day before it went. So every single morning you're reporting what you did. Some days you might not had uh, much to do, but 
you don't want to have a lot of those days. You want to you want to be doing something to be able to um, explain to the team. So everyone has transparency on a team. So we're like a team of of twelve people. Um, with about, um, I didn't mention this before, but I, I remember the number now, about 27 applications for the Federal Motor um, Carrier Safety Administration. So um, everyone's transparent on everybody's work, all 10 of us. Thank you. All right, uh, Laura, please go ahead. Okay, so during your interview process and um, training, did you ever have to go in person for your job? No, I, I actually did this interview online. So pretty much, um, I didn't mention that either. All my interviews that I did were either on the phone or they were basically on Teams or Zoom. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Isaac, please go ahead. Hello everyone, Kenny. It's been yeah. great, you know, listening to your story. I'm sorry that it did not work out favorably for you at Hologic, but I think it was all for the best, right? All for the best. Yes. Yeah, so, um, my question, my question is in regards to you say you're in upsec. So, do you work in conjunction with DevOps in the uh, the SDLC process so that they can give you the app and you? Kind of like try to poke holes through it to see whether it conforms to all these security uh, procedures that you have in place. Yes, okay, correct. That's the first exactly. Yep. Um, it, exactly how you explained it. Um, you didn't actually make a question. You actually made a statement. That's exactly um, what happens. So um, it goes through a, a life cycle, um, and releases are going out every every other day you have releases. So you'll see, um, so in the Confluence app that I was talking about earlier, um, we get this app, we, this, um, we get this notification that goes to our email. So say I didn't talk to anyone that day. Say I didn't um, do the morning meeting at nine o'clock. I'm still gonna be, me and my team, um, and right now we're just two, we have a, a few more analysts that are coming on. But right now it's just me and my um, my cybersecurity um, supervisor. We basically get these notifications in our email saying that release 36 um, is ready to go. The devs had done their testing and it's ready to move on to staging. So staging is is basically like it's basically like um, having like a clone of what it would look like for production, you know, because we're not we don't do we don't do the monitoring once it's in production the the SOC and the cyber teams the 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 bigger dot cybersecurity teams they would handle um you know the the, the continuous monitoring of the production so i'm just in that pre-production phase doing all those scans so exactly like you were saying isaac thank you thank you Ken. all right and uh i think i'll let priscilla go first before eric since Prisla didn't ask that question in person. Go ahead, Prisla. Hi, um, I wrote it in the chat, but I was wondering before you got your job, did you have, did you get a certification before or um, just based on the interview you landed the job? Um, it's, it's based on the interview I landed the job. And one of the interview questions um, I was asked uh, about the certification because during the pandemic, I was supposed to do my certification. Um, but when the when the pandemic had hit, um, and after I did the RMF class, I didn't end up doing the Security Plus at the time. So um, I was supposed to do another certification. It was called the CAP, um, Certified Authorization Professional. I paid $500, 500 for that, but then I got canceled with that during that was that was in 2020 during um, during COVID. So then, um, so that I, I basically um, delayed on that, and I said because I was desperate to get on my last job, and I told basically every employer that I'm gonna basically get the uh, security plus done within the next um, 
the next once I start or the next six months, if you it, like once they give me the job. So I was transparent about that, um, that I didn't have the that I didn't have the security plus. And then I remember even joking one time um, to Sheila that, you know, I'm, I'm going to go straight because I, I was so desperate to get out my last job that I stated that I was going to go straight for the CISSP. I don't, I don't even care about the security plus anymore, but come to find out um, the security, the security plus is actually more important than the CISSP um, for what I do. And um, everything that Dr. Do tells, tells you guys is, um, is facts. Cause I, I called Dr. Do one day. Um, I was stuck on, on understanding the software development life cycle um, 100%. I probably only knew like 20%. And my job is the software development life cycle. That's basically what, because cybersecurity analysts, they could be doing all different types of projects. But me specifically, I'm working with DevOps, literally. So Dr. Du was like, you need to polish on this stuff, you know? So that's what I went, I, I polished myself literally night till five in the morning, had to learn all that. But if I had to do it again, I would do the security plus test. Okay, right. thanks. Thank you. Okay, first Thanks. Uh, Eric, please go ahead. Oh, yes. Can you, uh, I have a, um, I want to ask you, do you get uh, some request to, in your position to participate in the awareness or training uh, team for your company? No, because we, we have a, we have a privacy officer. Um, and she handles, um, so in the documentation and controls, um, if you study a little bit RNF, RMF um, and the NIST um, and the overlays of the NIST, like there's the 853, the 61s, um, there's parts of it where the privacy officer handles those controls. And she doesn't really um, do like a privacy awareness, but we have like a department wide privacy awareness where they're actually doing, um, they're actually doing these little, they'll, well, they'll do like phishing emails. They'll, they'll do random tests on us um, and they're checking on us. So, um, so you have to be, so we're always like where we were told, I was told when I got hired and, and I'm told by that privacy officer that's what the, the that's what the um, the enterprise, DOT cyber. That's what they'll do. They'll they'll see if you're a capable worker that that follows um, that follows privacy, and they they expect you to know that stuff. And in, in your onboarding, you get all these privacy documents that you have to go over, um, on top of what you already know as a cybersecurity student. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh... Uh, Inter can ask your question. Please unmute yourself. Hello, uh, Dr. Edu. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening, Kenny. Um, I want to really thank you uh, the way you highlighted your day-to-day -day work versus what you learn from uh, our school uh, from Dr. Adu. Uh, I want, if you could kindly again, and uh, thank you again for your fighting spirit. I, I, I notice in your attitude, really, you are truly a fighter. You don't give up easily. You continue pushing, 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 way to go. And that, that really, I commend you for that. But thank you for somebody, for the new team who want really to be, to, to continue uh, studying uh, through this great school from Dr. Adu, mm -hmm. uh, could you really have, pinpoint like a in a point form what do you think you have learned from this school that has enabled you to land where you are 
really can you connect what uh, your what you are experiencing now, what you are doing today, mm -hmm. to what you have been learning from Dr. Adu, so that really mm -hmm. it, it could uh, in the future highlight uh, help us all to know that step by step what okay. you have to do really if you stay focused you work hard this is where you can reach because dr adul say to us he mm -hmm. explained to us he teach us but when it comes from you say i learned this from him i learned this from him mm -hmm. i do this and this is his credit i want it's like a giving the credit to the school so that people would understand that this is the place we are really blessed to be in this place and then we can continue work hard and eventually we are going to become other other you and in the future really this is for dr edu i, I would love to say look you know i'm from africa we talk about villages i think one day i dream to see uh, cyber security villagers like uh, you guys, Kenny, and thank you so much for coming, Sheila, and all the other friends coming every time you come to support the village so that it, Dr. Edu continue to have more <laughs> young people and uh, new people entering the business so that the village will continue to grow and grow and grow. Thanks so much. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I'm being lost. yeah, it's okay. Uh, so, um, so after you after you asked you a couple of questions, then you then you um then you had some um, good statements. Um, and I, I agree with you. I agree with you a lot. Everything that you said is um is is facts, and um it's a it's a vision that is going to happen. Um, because there's. Like I always tell my, like I always tell my um, project manager all the time, there's so many gaps to fill. Whether it's in the government, when you, whether you're doing cybersecurity to support the government, whether you're doing it for uh, another private, um, you're you're in the pr private sector. There's 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 a lot, and and where and where Doctor Do comes in is this this this. I can't, I can't explain that all tonight because it would take forever and I can talk forever. Like you guys don't want to hear me talk forever. I but, agree. Um, to keep it short, I took, I took courses other places. I, I, I've taken edX, I, I did Udemy, I did Cybrary. Dr. Du's way of, of, of teaching, it gives you the holistic foundational fundamentals of cybersecurity. Yeah. So you. when you're learning, so like for an example, the hands-on course, you're not learning one tool, you're learning a diverse amount of tools. So even if you go to a job and you don't, you don't learn, I mean, you don't, you don't actually use what, um, hundred percent what you learned in Dr. Zhu's class, but the amount of, the amount of difficulty that Dr. Du's course puts you on to, to think, research, analyze, you're you're gonna pick up on any anything that you're stuck on on your day to day job. Um, it translates, so like it might not be the same exact like wording, but the language that you learn from the hands on class, um, I'm sure the entry level class, um, it's gonna translate into whatever specialty of cybersecurity. So that's where Doctor Do. Um, that's where Dr. Du's method of teaching comes into play because it's totally different than these other schools that are charging you fifteen to twenty five thousand dollars, or even even doing a master's program at Georgia Tech, even though they offer it for ten thousand. You're not gonna learn because Dr. Du goes over not only RMF like some of these gurus out here are selling. He's doing all the foundationals that include the RMF into it. Thank you. So. Um, and then after there's a psychology part of his teaching um that psychology was a subject that i loved in college there's not that many cybers there's not that many um professors or teachers out there that give you the 
that give you the psychology behind the, the mind of the cybersecurity professional before you actually do the job. He actually gives you that mindset before. Like a lot of the courses, you do it and it's good luck. Take care. Dr. Do is telling you, Dr. Do will be brutally honest with you and be like, you need to work on this. You know what, work on that. Go read it if you, if you go to him and you have questions. So it's, so it's like that small class, small number of, of students that really want it. And um, his, his teachings match that. So it translates for you to go out there um, to do your interviews, um, to do your daily job. And, uh, and also too, another thing that I'll mention, um, the other half of, half of your cybersecurity studying and, and um, knowledge attainment is it's, it's you. It's really up to you too about where you wanna go. You have to have a plan. You know, at the same time, Dr. Du is saying all the people in the internship, everyone in the classes, we can, we can go to other countries one day. We can, we can go to Africa and represent a Ritmus to the embassy and work on this cybersecurity posture. But individually, you have to still put in the work. So it could become like a whole collective vision. And then you also have to have a plan for yourself. So later on, you could, um, you could give back in the, whether it's to someone that doesn't know about cybersecurity already or give back to the, give back to the school. Um, and, and you have to have that plan. So, so my plan, I'll personally tell you is, my plan is not to attain all these certifications and just be a technical cybersecurity guru. My plan, because I have a business background, so I want, to, I want to use cybersecurity and merge it with my business background. So that's why I, I, I'm doing the PCI DSS class um, because it, it um, I, I, I talked to Dr. Du a few times um, and he's, he's very transparent. And he let me know, you can do this, you can do that. You can get back into sales with this. And, um, and, and my goal is to, to learn these tools, um, um, learn all the frameworks I can, and then after be a cybersecurity sales professional in the future, um, hopefully making half a million dollars. All right, all right, Kenny. Uh, thank you for your kind words. And were you part of the, uh, you were part of the internship at a point? Like, did you go through all the way? Um, no, I didn't go through the internship because, um, because I had a lot of issues going on with my last employer. Um, and so I, I, I didn't have time to do, I had to do a lot of, during the time that the, inter, the internships were going on, I was doing a lot of law case reviews on my own to deal with my last employer. So I didn't have time. I wanted to, I wanted to do the internship, but I, you know, I, I was my own lawyer for something I was dealing with, so. Okay. All right, Kenny, uh, thank you very much. So for uh, everybody, if you have any question, if you put a question in the chat and I couldn't get to it, you can please ask. Uh, so it doesn't look like I ignored your question. All right, go ahead, Linda. The pay uh, Kenny, oh. um, can you uh, wait, give Linda, us an on. idea of your, your pay? How much you getting paid for on your current job? I get paid 3,500 every two weeks. So that would, we have 26 weeks in a year. I think it came out to, I know it's between, um, it's about 90,000, I think. Yeah. I don't know, you could, you could do the, the math, 3,500 times 26. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, but it's 3,500 every two weeks. I don't okay. know, I just go by, I just go by the bi-weekly because that's what they put on my offer letter. So, okay. So I didn't, I never even calculated the, I was so happy because it was 40% higher than what I got. And let me tell you guys something. I could have got way more if I went, if, if, I, if I wasn't in the situation, because I was in a unique situation. So I would never want, I would never wish you guys to be in the situation that I was. Um, but but say, say you're not in the situation I'm in and, um, and you're new to, to, to the Rimmis Academy and Dr. Du, you can just um, go to, you know, go to the entry level course if you haven't started. Um, do the, do the, um, security plus, um, and, and then after, once you're able to know, like all the foundational fundamentals, 
every job description, you already have the knowledge. You'll, you'll have the tools already. So, so in my situation, there was a lot of jobs that I, I turned down myself. I, I withdrawed myself because I felt like I was ready. So I was really kind of looking for something entry um, that I know that I could, I could learn, you know, on the job. But if I, if I went through the right way, I went through Dr. Du to help me with the, with the interviews and so forth, I would have, I would have been through the roof. I would, my salary would have been so high every two weeks. Yeah. All right, thank you, Linda. I think uh, Inter had another question, like a follow-up question. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it, it, it was uh, really, he answered that into his last statement, but also I wanted really to thank him for his uh, generous sharing of uh, really uh, op with his open heart. I could feel that uh, I understood even better the job uh, of uh, cybersecurity uh, in the practical terms uh, while she was explaining. Thanks so much and thank you, Doctor. Okay, you uh, thank you. And I think uh, we'll take Mona's last question and then that will be it. Uh, Mona is asking, did your job furnish you with the necessary hardware that uh, you needed to do your, your work? So i.e., did they send you a, like a laptop or a desktop at home that you're using to work? Yeah, so I have a laptop, um, this is what it looks like. Just a just a regular Dell that I use. Um, that barcode on it, it has it has your number. It has my it has the the laptop number, and they and they have it that they know that I'm the one that has it. Um, and then they also match it to my PIV card. So this is what a PIV card looks like. So if you're ever going into the departments on um, buildings, so. Um, I went to get this card in Boston. So like if I ever had to go to Boston um, to discuss anything with um, one of our other teams, I would use this card to get through the buildings. Um, and then it, this card also goes into my laptop. So there's also a slide on the laptop in the corner, right here where you can see, and you slide it in and, if you, can, and you have a pin code. If you don't know that pin code, um, you're gonna have to wait like uh, you're gonna have to wait like two three days for them to reset because there's so many tickets that the support. So we have a so Department of Transportation has a support team that um, that handles our department's um, support tickets. So they would handle um, all that stuff in Washington D.C. Um, to reset pins and you have to go through a lot. So they tell us don't lose anything. All right, thank you, Kenan. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time. And I mean, uh, for everybody who was on here at the beginning, sorry for all that drama. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, I'm, I, I've put uh, our numbers in the chat. Uh, please go ahead and reach out if you need, you know, uh, help with deciding on, you know, which part to go and whatnot. Uh, we are really here to help. Uh, and we are starting our internship uh, slash workshop program by the end of the month. Uh, most people have registered for it. Those who are non-students and for uh, all our students, we will be uh, sending out the registration form. Okay. Uh, if you want to know more about it, you can uh, contact us on the details that I put in there. So I put all my details in there, including LinkedIn and everything. So uh, if you want to check us out, uh, please do. Uh, we are very accessible and easy uh, all over the place. And people that we bring on here are, you know, our own. Uh, they've gone through our training and they are working and we are bringing them back to share the experience and also to motivate everybody. So if you're trying to get into the industry to let you know that it is very doable, can you switch from the health, you know, side uh, into cybersecurity? Most people here, same story. Uh, if you're thinking about, oh, somebody told you you need to have a degree. There is somebody on here who has only high school He's working, making almost like what a hundred. So uh, it is very doable. You can do it. Cybersecurity uh, field is still growing. Uh, they need more people. Uh, as of now, there is around almost like five hundred thousand on field cybersecurity jobs in the United States alone. 
right? And, you know, stuff like this, when I say, don't take my word for it, go check it out. Uh, CyberSeek is a government website. They have real, like, real-time uh, cybersecurity, uh, uh, like, show, uh, openings, you know, uh, around the United States by state and whatnot. And if you've not taken our free course, please do. Uh, you can uh, always take that. And uh, I can promise you, you learn something new, regardless of, you know, how many years of uh, experience you have in cybersecurity or IT in general. So I'm going to put our uh, details in here again. Uh, you can reach out to us. And next week, we'll still be doing uh, the cyber chat, right? And uh, I put in the link to the free course. Uh, I'm going to put in my details in here and for the school. LinkedIn, everything is on there. You can uh, check us out. We want to hear from you as well. Uh, emails and everybody who, you know, try to contact us, you know, uh, especially if you contact me directly, uh, I'll get back to you as soon as possible because I'm very busy. If I don't, it's just going to get, you know, sharp into the pile. So sometimes you call me and I, like, I'll pick, be like, hmm, this guy. If I don't, um, so like, you might think I ignored you, but I didn't. Right. So I just respond to, you know, stuff like that when I have the time. Right. I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very much. Uh, next week, we are still meeting around the same time and we'll be bringing another one of our own. Oh, Laura has a uh, has her hand up. Uh, Laura, please go ahead and then we wrap it up. OK, quick question for uh, Kenny or, or doctor. Um, what is the specific job title for phishing or random wear? If you all know. Oh, job title for phishing or run, uh, ransomware? Yeah. Um, oh, wait, analysis, maybe? No. Say that so, again? Mm -hmm. what, were you about to say something, Isaac? Yeah, I was just giving my, my thought about it. Uh, I okay. think that would fall under uh, malware analysis, which is known uh, as standalone kind of like position, but uh, one of the functions of, that's what, I, that's my thinking. I could be wrong. No, you're actually right. So uh, some organizations, depending on the size of the organization, they might have like a malware analyst. But for most organizations that are not that big, that will fall under like a job title for somebody like a cyber security specialist or cyber security analyst or information security analyst or information assurance analyst, right? But for big organizations or organizations that maybe particularly, you know, they have a, like a specific interest in that, they might have like a malware analyst uh, specifically for, you know, malware. And I think I missed somebody's question. They were asking about job titles. So job titles in cyber security, uh, they range from like the most very popular ones that you see are the analyst ones, information security analyst, cyber security analyst, information assurance analyst, uh, cyber security specialist, uh, uh, cyber security architect, cyber security uh, uh, engineer, right? So like the job titles can go on and on, but mostly uh, it gets tricky with the job titles because you might hold a certain job title and be doing a set, like a different job that is not even, you know, that pertains to the job title, right? Because we can have two uh, cyber security analysts in two different companies, but they'll be doing totally two different things, right? So, and then we might have a cyber security specialist who are doing, the job they are doing is actually a job description for cyber security analyst. And somebody is cyber security analyst, but they're doing the job of a cyber security engineer, right? So sometimes uh, the job titles, you know, uh, they are good for what they are. At least they have to put like a title on the position they are putting you in. But that is why it is good to have a solid foundation in all the areas of cyber security, that way you'll be able to function. Because if, uh, let's say, they brought you in to do malware analyst, you know, like uh, Laura asked, and now they have other needs and they don't have the money to bring somebody else on to do maybe compliance, guess who will be doing compliance? <laughs> you. <laughs> okay. So you have to, you know, school yourself on all that. You don't have, you can't be an expert in all the areas, but at least you should know enough, you know, to start you know, the ball rolling or like to start like rolling uh, like the whole process. That way, when they switch you into any uh, like position, it's easy for you to catch up and, you know, learn really quick on the job like Kenny was saying, right? I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, if you have any, uh, there's something in the chat. And I just wanted to say one quick thing before yeah, I go. go ahead, Kenny. Um, um, one thing I, I, I didn't um, shine on today was soft skills. Um, soft skills 
are huge. Um, there's a lot of politics, a lot of politics. Um, so, and that's what I meant, the psychology of where Dr. Du will tell you like what goes on behind the scenes. It's, it's everything he's saying about it, about it, I see it on a daily basis. There's a lot of politics. And so you use your soft skills, um, even in your emails. I even watch how I send emails to my coworkers. So there's, a, there's, there's even ways of how to send emails. You can't just send it, you just can't send an email just the way that you want, you know? So I just wanted to just mention soft skills are very important on the job. All right, Kenny, uh, we appreciate your time and for sharing your experience with us. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everybody else for, you know, spending time. Uh, we went a little bit over our time, but I mean, it was worth it because we learned a lot from Kenny. I appreciate everybody's time. We'll meet the same, but we meet same time next week. Uh, if I, I sent you, you were asking a question and uh, I put a note in there to call me, you can, you know, send me a test or email, I will respond. All right, thank you everybody. Uh, we will meet next week, God willing. Uh, have a blessed weekend. Thank you, Mr. Edu. Thank you.